Hello and welcome to Fruit and Extraneous. I'll be your host, Teddy Alexander Evans, and today I have with me Anthony Morgan and Kenyon Farrell, and I'm here at the New York City headquarters of the NYS Black Gay Network, and today they're going to tell us about their organization. So thank you both for joining us today, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Farrell. Sure, no problem. I will open the floor to you both. So can you tell us a little bit more about your organization? Sure. Um, New York State Black Gay Network is a um, member organization of 16 organizations that all expressly serve black men who practice same-sex desire across the urban centers in New York State. And what we do as a network is to provide um, technical assistance and training support for our member organizations, um, but to also do advocacy and programming work in communities with our member organizations, ally organizations, and community members to basically build the capacity of, of communities really to respond uh, to their own needs. So exactly, exactly in plain terms, technical assistance. If I didn't know what that <laughs> meant, tell them what that means. Sure, technical assistance means um, helping our organizations to um, be self-sustaining in different ways. So um, if organizations need uh, support in doing, say, programming for black gay youth, um, we help them build the uh, infrastructure to uh, do those actual programs. Sometimes it's improving those programs. Sometimes it's helping to um, assist organizations with uh, funding structures um, or you know operational infrastructures, those kind of things. Okay. So when did all this get started? How did all this get started? Who started all this? Um, it started um, about seven years ago actually with some conversations of, of black gay men in uh, an apartment <laughs> here in New York City uh, with uh, folks from uh, upstate, from Rochester, Buffalo, and the Capital District, um, Albany, and Syracuse with New York City folks talking about the need for some sort of cohesive um, body to be able to advocate um, on behalf of black gay men um, in the, in the state and with the, the federal government, government in terms of actual uh, funding dollars and support for their, their programs which are underfunded. And so uh, the network sort of started as a, a sort of loose collection of, of, of organizations trying to sort of do um, some advocacy work and then later uh, established itself as a, as a nonprofit organization of its own. That's good. So what exactly is your position in the organization? I'm the Communications and Public Education Coordinator. And so my position, I do um, all of the media relations work and also um, do several of the public education projects specifically here in New York City, um, one of which is um, the Revival Initiative which is a part of the sort of black uh, campaign for black gay men's lives but started earlier um, and that initiative started out of uh, individuals in our member organizations and um, black gay community activists saying you know we've been hearing all of this homophobic <laughs> Uh, garbage spewing from uh, black clergy, you know, in the last couple of years, and we need to develop a response to it. Mm -hmm. And so the Revival Project um, brought together several of those organizations, us, the New York State Black Gay Network, um, Gay Men of African Descent, Unity Fellowship Church, um, Empire State Pride Agendas, Pride in the Pulpit, and Soul Force mm -hmm. as the main conveners of an event that happened last July at Riverside Church, which was a public event which turned out about 400 people um, to challenge specifically homophobia and to position it as spiritual violence um, coming from the pulpit and the need for uh, black LGBT folks to also create their own spaces of worship and healing. So, Mr. Camerashai, Mr. Morgan, <laughs> what would your position in the company be? Uh, what I do with the New York State Black Gay Network is um, I'm in the position of a Craig G. Harris fellow, and uh, Craig G. Harris was or is a long-term 
activists um, within the blanket community and the network created the Craig G. Harris position roughly about four years ago. So I'm the fourth Craig G. Harris fellow and um, working on two projects specifically. One is the Campaign for Black Women's Lives, which we're going to talk about here today, um, and the other is Fluid Bodies. And so um, what Fluid Bodies is, it's, um, it's an effort uh, to better understand the needs of gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual peoples of uh, Caribbean descent. Mm -hmm. So the project mainly focuses in on uh, folks who are from English-speaking Caribbean countries um, who have recently immigrated here or who were born here but have parents who are from the Caribbean um, to get a better look at the needs of Caribbean folks. Do you mean New York specifically or the United States? Uh, New, York specifically. New York specifically. Yeah, New York specifically. So a lot of what the Fluid Bodies works work looks like is um, really trying to get a better understanding of where folks are going for services, what the challenges are, what are some barriers to even getting into any particular health services, what are the mental health needs, what are the social needs, and so on. Um, once we get that information through the various sort of data collection tools we've created, um, we intend on creating programs and sort of bridging the gap between the service and the population. So, personally, Tell me, what are your views, honestly, on black gay life? Black gay men in New York City, um, Bainey, because that's my experience, are incredibly, um, well, one, incredibly resilient, I think, given the history of sort of gay in the U.S., the history of black in the U.S., and so therefore the history of black and gay um, in the U.S., and I think incredibly um, talented in terms of getting what's there, resources, social resources, the places that we are allowed to kind of celebrate our lives and celebrate each other. Um, and even the ways in which we, you know, we sort of reach out to kind of interact with each other on a sexual space. So I would say that Black Gay Life is alive. Um, and I would also say to someone coming in, I guess from, you know, Columbus, Ohio, <laughs> to someone sort of coming into New York City and wanting to experience a black gay life, I would definitely say that there are a lot of things, as in any community, that you would want to be conscious of. There are a lot of issues that we sort of are dealing with. HIV is one of them. It's not the only one. Internal homophobia is one of them. It's not the only one. But that there are also a number of scenes and a number of sort of collectives and, and, and places where you can sort of exist in a fun, self-affirming and self-loving way. So. Yeah. So you touched on that briefly. What are your views on HIV in the African American community? Honestly. Honestly, you know, honestly, you both are getting the question, so yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> it, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's obviously a travesty. I mean, it's it's obviously a, a catastrophe, um, and I think it's 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 a catastrophe for a number of reasons. Um, often like. times, for, well, yeah, often times for me, the the conversation about HIV can't be had separate from conversations about poverty, or separate from conversations about how people are educated, um, separate from conversations about how we sort of raise our children to be non sexual or to be sexual and how we sort of push certain ideologies around what hetero mm -hmm. sort of sexuality is and what it does. Um, so I think the HIV epidemic amongst African Americans is perhaps right now, and I, I kind of dare to say, one of our biggest issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a catastrophe and I dare to say it is our biggest issue. Um, and, you know, I, I stand clear that if the the conversations aren't had about sexuality and sex and poverty and economics and so on, we're kind of dancing in a circle and we're not really trying to look for an end to HIV AIDS in black or African American communities. And I would agree that I don't think that you can look at it out of the context of the, the totality of our condition, you know, because one of the things I always say to people is, well, I mean, let's look at just even in terms of health, right? I mean, you know, black folks in America suffer, you know, from higher rates of heart disease, of diabetes, women from breast cancer, you know, and a, a host of other things, um, hypertension, um, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and, and HIV is another sort of indicator, you know, within all of that. HIV carries a bigger stigma, um, and it you know, um, you know, is to a certain extent, you know, a, a fatal, um, you know, uh, illness. So, you know, it, it sort of carries those extra, um, you know, layers of, of sort of baggage, if you will. But ultimately, when you look at, you know, the totality of, of everything else, and as Anthony said, in terms of poverty, unemployment, um, you know, other issues around health, 
um, imprisonment, and so on and so forth, that um, it, it makes perfect sense in a very bizarre way within that context. So, okay, Magic Lab, Magic Wand, if there's one thing you could change about gay black life, gay African American life, excuse me, it would be... Go. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I would I would bring it back to you know we've had this conversation a million times. I think just the ways I would like to change. I would like to see people value themselves and each other more. I would like to see less shade and more um, you know more sort of value and not in some kind of like you know hokey nineteen sixties hippie folk singer sort of you know <laughs> love each other and blah blah blah, but. I do feel sometimes, um, you know, part of the, the sort of culture of shade, I think, really kind of exposes um, a level of, of, of nihilism and a, a level of which people really don't have respect for, you know, other black gay lives. And so I think I would like to sort of see the culture of the community shift to really you know, take care of, of each other, um, you know, in a, in a different way. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I agree. Um, I, I would really want to see the ways in which um, gay men, lesbian women, transgender uh, men and women are, um, the way that they're conditioned to see themselves and the way that they're conditioned to see other people. Um, I think what um, the Campaign for Black Gay Men's Lives does in addressing the social value of black gay men in New York City is it really sort of pulls the cover off of the sort of uh, I guess, a fair, um, really, that the black community has with gay folks um, in that, you know, it really doesn't allow gay men to sort of see themselves as full beings and sort of allow people to become the full expression of who they are. Rather, it's, you know, you need to exist in this particular way and that way, you know, it's either beneficial to us or it isn't. Um, so that would really be my wish is that, you know, particularly black, gay, and lesbian, and transgender folks would be able to see themselves in lights that are more affirming and that are more honest in who they are. So going back to your organization, how is that going to help? Well, I think oftentimes, you know, and as Anthony mentioned with the Campaign for Black Gay Men's Lives, I think um, so much of, of our experience, and I think, you know, particularly as, you know, 20, 30-somethings, basically the generation, you know, who grew up, um, you know, under the stigma of AIDS, you know, um, that um, that we not see ourselves as as simply um, you know vectors of disease and 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 everything that is um, you know sort of wrong and, and ill with the black community at large because I think that's where a lot of that that conversation sort of stems and so I think that this campaign because it really focuses on our value as individuals as black gay folks um, as a community and black gay folks within the black community having value um, I think that that's a different a, 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 sh a paradigm shift quite frankly from you know what we often get in terms of messaging around you know HIV you black gay man need to wear a condom because you're bad sure. <laughs> and and whatever else versus you know what what would it look like to really talk about you have value and you have and this community loves you and and respects you and values your place in it and and what a, a message around sort of safety and 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 wholeness and well-being shifts the HIV paradigm from that point. So specifically, how is your organization going to go about doing that? Specifically, what are your... um, specifically, um, what we're doing is um, one is is launching uh, the campaign, which is going to be largely a sort of social marketing campaign that's going to you know kind of hit folks where they are on the subway at the bus station, you know, in Harlem. So will it be actual people or will it be like more visual? It will be, yeah, it'll be visual. I mean, there's going to be a couple facets. This this portion of it um, will be a, a visual 
you know, sort of campaign speaking to, you know, those issues. Um, but what we're also planning to do is to not just sort of have, you know, so, you know, bus stop A has the, you know, this ad there, and then folks in the community sort of have to sort of see it and, and respond to it, but to also have, you know, kind of a, a group of, of black gay men who are going to go into communities where the campaign launches and speak to different groups within that community, be they churches, be they community board, be they, you know, whatever, to then talk about what's up with that bus station, or, you know, the, the, the bus ad right there, and what's the need for it, and what do we need, um, you know, as a, you know, as folks within the community um, to see sort of change. Um, so I think, you know, that's sort of one step. Yeah, I mean, and just a little bit more on, on the, the placement of the visual campaign is that the, the, the thinking behind going into the neighborhoods where the campaign will launch is that often, you know, I myself, someone who used to live in Brooklyn and now lives in Harlem, will see campaigns at bus stops or train stations and really just kind of glaze by it and don't really kind of take it in. And the idea is that you are collaborating with those communities, which, I mean, for the most part are non-LGBT communities, but black communities, to be able to say, hey, this is a problem and this is the actual problem, you know, uh, black gay men in the past, you know, let's just say seven months, you know, a number of murders have occurred. Uh, 2005, the CDC said that at least 46% of black gay men were infected with HIV. So this is a problem, and these are the reasons why the campaign is going up in this, in this community, and that this is what we're asking of you. Um, I love to think about the campaign as a collaboration between um, gay black men and people concerned about gay black men who may or may not be gay or lesbian, and non-gay black communities. So, for example, another way that we are sort of addressing the social value of black gay men is uh, we're planning a series of anti-homophobia events to take place in parks in Harlem and in Brooklyn. So the thinking behind the events is really to sort of have this collaboration happen between gay folks and non-gay folks to kind of say, look, homophobia is really tearing the black community apart outside of, you know, the politics of, of sort of sexual orientation. It really does impact the ways in which we're able to do prevention effectively. So so, you know, becoming sort of, sort of coming together as a collective to create something we believe is powerful. So what's being created essentially is a piece of artwork that we're hoping to get installed in some of the parks that we do the work in so that when the communities are sort of in their space, in their community, they, they have this visual reminder of the campaign for black gay men's lives that says something about homophobia, that says something about the value of black gay men that are in their lives in ways that they probably don't even know. Your brother, a cousin, a babysitter, or, you know, the person who does your laundry, whatever. Um, so that's one of the other ways in which we're trying to really sort of drill into people's minds that black gay men have an enormous value. And in, in people's minds includes black gay men. So as you said before, something about living in New York City, um, the West Village is a very big part of that. Christopher Street in particular, mm -hmm. will you be doing anything down there? Will you be going down there? Will the media blitz hit down there? Um, I think we'll do a lot of work in terms of, I mean, it's a good place to do, um, you know, sort of outreach and to specifically sort of target because folks just kind of go to Migrate. That. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it is a migration. Folks migrate to that space. And, however, I think um, what, what actually, there's been work, you know, that's happened, um, you know, in the Westville around particular issues. And I think our focus is to actually think about, well, why are these folks coming to the West Village, right? Mm -hmm. And so to sort of turn our focus to these communities, to Best Eye, to Harlem, to, you know, Brownsville, East New York, to Jamaica, Queens, where folks are coming from, so that, and not to say that folks don't have the right and can't, because I'll still go to Christopher Street, but that also it may mean something different if I also know that my own community where I live, which is now I live in East New York, um, just recently moved there, is a safe place for me to be. I mean, and, and the, the network through its member organizations have relationship with, relationships with some of the social venues in the West Village, so Chi Chi's, The Hangar, and so on, where uh, black gay men do actually go and hang out and walk by to get to the pier. So we imagine doing some real sort of 
intense work with those institutions to kind of get the word about the campaign out, even if it means getting them a banner, you know, right, right, right. Black Gay Pride that says the campaign for Black Gay Men's Lives or whatever the case it is. So it'll definitely hit the West Village. So um, as someone who used to live in East New York, I, allow, I now live in Harlem. I used to live in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, how do I say this diplomatically? These aren't the um, easiest neighborhoods to grow up in. Mm -hmm. So are we expecting any type of backlash? Mm -hmm. I mean, because we know how it is to live in these neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and it's not um, the friendliest. Right. So tell yeah. us. I, I mean, I do, yeah, we expect, <laughs> like, to some extent, you know, some type of, of you know, of backlash. I mean, it's been really interesting doing, you know, being involved in some of the work around the Rashawn Brazel case, um, you know, here in New York, and, and flyering at Nostrand and Fulton, right? Deep. And, you know, about, you know, this black gay man whose body parts were found in that subway station and talking to folks mm -hmm. about it at 6 p.m., you know, in the evening when everybody's sort of in transit there and having... Um, in in two events of doing that at that particular location, only having one sort of unkind word that was said, you know, when the brother got way up the block. Oh. <laughs> right? So, you know, um, so, I mean, that's, you know, it's also been interesting to also sort of see, you know, in, 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 in doing that work that there are folks in the neighborhood who are concerned, you know, quite frankly. And so while I do, you know, obviously expect some level of back, backlash and people prop, you know, maybe keying on the thing, but that also still means that you have reacted to it. You've seen it. You've had whatever sort of visceral reaction to it and a, like a person sort of, you know, doing defacing something or whatever is a that's it, it still means that that person has kind of you know process it, it processed yeah. that right so I, I don't think that that's necessarily a, a loss or yeah. a, that we've lost if that there's no such thing as bad publicity what you mean? yeah I mean I, I would I, for me I would definitely say that the fantasy is not that we would you know launch the campaign in, in Jamaica Queens and no one would say nothing and then it'd be perfect and you know right. they folks will kind of see it and then everyone would you know know where to go <laughs> I would actually, not encourage, but I look forward to the backlash because I really do agree that when you sort of make the effort to respond to something, it kicks something up in you and whether or not you decide to be, hopefully not, you decide to be violent around that reaction or you just decide to kind of spray paint something, that's publicity. And I think that kind of publicity is needed and I've thought that for a while because I think homophobia um, really does need to be exposed and it really does need to be talked about in a way that directly connects it to the ways in which people who live in those communities who aren't heterosexual have to construct their lives and the ways in which they have to sort of renegotiate how they value their lives and how they protect themselves. So it definitely is publicity and I, I you know, I, I would welcome it actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we'll be standing there. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and ultimately nothing nothing changes without conflict or without, you know, some level of, of tension. I think that's, um, you know, I mean, as Anthony just said, if, if everything just sort of remained, and that's been, I mean, a part of, of how we've had to sort of construct our lives is sort of the don't ask, don't tell. Sure. You know, people can kind of know, but as long as you don't say it, you know, then it's, or make, or make you know, sort of straight people sort of confront it mm -hmm. with, you know, your presence in, in some way. Um, but then to actually, you know, to, to shift that so that folks do have to think about you. And, and um, I was at an event in Philly and had a straight black man asked about homophobia in this talk he was giving, say, well, gay people are black. Right. And I never heard that before, <laughs> like never heard that before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to, to be able to, to make that kind of shift so that people do see us as black people in, in the community and so on and so forth and, and have value on that level, then, yeah, there has to be some level of, of attention and yeah. then things in order for things to change. Wow. So you all have thought this, thought this out pretty well. Huh? Yeah. For yeah, years, I've been writing that. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's so funny. I was born in 1981, and as we're celebrating, that we're celebrating, as we're sort of celebrating slash commemorating the sort of 25 years of HIV/AIDS. I also turned 25, and what I 
what I see the most in my 25 years, I guess, I can't really count all those 25 years, is the silence. The, the deafening silence as concerns the lives of black gay men. And it's just, it, it amazes me that, you know, reports can come out of the CDC that say that, you know, damn near half of us are infected with HIV and there isn't the, a peep, you know, like no one says anything. Well, the fact that, you know, black gay men can be dismembered or black gay men can be shot or, you know, hit with barbells in the face till they're dead. And the media coverage does doesn't sort of take it up as though this is an actual issue. And for me, the campaign excites me. Um, it, it really is about interrupting the silence that happens when you talk about black gay men and the ways in which we are allowed and not allowed to exist. So I'm incredibly excited about yeah. it. That's very good. So I will open up the floor to you. Is there anything else that you just want to get out there? Do anything else you want to say about the organization, about life, anything? Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. <laughs> Go. Keep it clean. That's all I ask. I, yeah. <laughs> I'll definitely do that. I mean, I just would tell, you know, folks who are, who are watching um, that if you want to get involved with the campaign, then you need to contact us here at New York State Black Gay Network. You can email ourlivesmatter at yahoo.com. Ourlivesmatter at yahoo.com. Exactly. And get more information about um, the campaign or any of the other work that we're doing here at the network. Okay. Mr. Farrell, Mr. Morgan, thank you very much. You. It was a pleasure being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Teddy Alexander Adams, and thank you for joining us. Have a nice night.